Well, let's turn to the, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, and we'll continue our series on the Lord's Prayer, making the Lord's Prayer my prayer. Matthew chapter 6, and as you turn there, if you don't mind standing for the reading of God's Word, I appreciate you honoring that. And JV Point needs to get on out of here. Thank you, Gary, for that reminder. JV Point, your environment is awaiting you. And if I'm, if I'm right, the next two Sundays they won't meet, right? The fourth Sunday and then a crazy fifth Sunday they won't meet. They meet three out of the first three out of every four. The JV Point ministry is a way to try to uh, transition them from kids' ministries full on to adult ministry. So they do music with us and we give them their own teaching. But once out of the month they get to hear me or have to hear me, however you want to say that. Uh, anyway, so that's what that is. But uh, today they can be dismissed and have their own teaching. Matthew 6, if you're there, say, let's go. I got the Living Bible at first, uh, start on the screen, verse 31 through 34, and then we'll read the Lord's Prayer together or say the Lord's Prayer together uh, before we get in the message. So don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathen? For they take pride in all these things and are deeply concerned about them. But your heavenly Father already knows... Did you notice? Your heavenly Father. There's the word again. Abba, Papa. He's our Father. He knows we already need these things perfectly well uh, that before we even ask. And He will give them to you if you give Him. And here it is. If you give Him first place in your life and live as He wants you to. So don't be anxious about tomorrow. Don't be anxious about all the stuff, all the provision, about how you're going to make it through retirement, how you're going to make it through tomorrow. God will take care of you tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. Let's all say that last line together. Live one day at a time. Amen. Could you pray with me? Trespasses is what we'll use, okay? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. God, speak to us and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Thank you for your help there. Appreciate that. I cited a study in the first service that talked about what people pray about most. The top thing most people pray about is their problems. And then second behind that is their prosperity. So they're wanting God to fix something or they're wanting God to bless their socks off. Not that either of those are wrong. It's just the things. But as we get lower, it gets crazier. They're also praying for their favorite sports team. So if you've been praying for the Falcons or any sports team in Georgia, you need to pray harder. Right? <laughs> I've got tomatoes being thrown at me. Okay, so then they're praying to win the lottery <laughs> or for a good parking space or not to get a ticket. Which is, you know, there's nothing really wrong with those prayers except I think they're missing the heartbeat of it. When the disciples saw Jesus praying, they said, hey, we want to do that. We want to we see how we can learn to pray. They didn't say, teach us to preach, teach us to sing, teach us to build a church, just teach us to do that, teach us to pray. And Jesus, through Matthew 6 and Luke 11, taught us how to pray without being self-absorbed, with it being a prayer that is a relationship with the Father, which is so important that we enter into prayer as an intimate relationship, Father, Child. We, we have to get out of praying like he's Santa Claus in the sky and we're bringing our wish list. Get out of praying like he's a, a rich uncle who we're brown nosing to get some favors from. He's not a sugar daddy that we get on his arm on Sunday, make him look good, and then he gives us what we want. Uh, he's, he's not a genie we rub the right way and then he gives us wishes. That is not prayer. Prayer is talking to a father who already knows the needs we have. And when we come to him as a father, he likes to give us the things that we have need of. So prayer is more relational than it is transactional. And that's where we're getting to. I always want to open up with that through this series. Two little qualifying points in your outline before we get going. Number one, I want to mention that the first petitions we've been covering 
hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Those are prayers and petitions putting God in his rightful place in heaven and in our heart. The next petitions that we're going to start today are more personal, but they're inviting the awesomeness of God into our daily situation. They're inviting him to be active in the struggles of our daily lives. We start off with God. Everybody say, I'm listening. Prayer starts off with him, not us. I'm not saying it's wrong to ever just start off with something you need. I'm just saying as a general daily time with the Lord, it starts with God and his greatness, his awesomeness, which, by the way, I personally believe if a prayer starts with God, it will end up in peace. You will have peace if you start with him because we're starting with how big he is, not how big your problems are. Watch the difference. If I say, Lord, you're amazing, you're awesome, and there's nothing too hard for you, by the time I get to my job situation or my family situation, I'm already chill because, God, you're so much bigger than that. You got that. But if I start with how big my problem is and how, how desperately miserable I am on this job and how poor we are and how we can't keep the lights on, we never get to realizing God is big enough to handle all that. So we start with the greatness of God and say, your kingdom come, your will be done, holy is your name, and then we get to our daily struggles and we segue from who he is to inviting him to be that in our daily walk. He's awesome, so be awesome here, right? So here's what we invite him in. We say, give us this day our daily bread, which I think is in your outline. That's our struggle for survival. That's essential needs. So first of all, I want you to get out of the thinking of whole wheat. That's not the only thing we're praying for here. God, give us today wheat or give us today multigrain. That's not it. Our, our daily bread is our essentials. It's companionship. It's relationship. It's anointing. It's power. It's health. It's healing. It's strength for today. It's all the things we need in life. We're inviting the awesome God to show up and provide. Then we say, forgive us our sins and our trespasses, and this is guarding us or helping us in our struggle uh, against uh, sin and resentment. So when we say, God, I know you're awesome and you're a savior, so come forgive me so I don't live under a cloud of condemnation, or I don't live resentful and bitter. That was the next one. Go to the next one right quick so they can fill in that blank. It's helping me against sin and resentment. You're awesome, so be awesome in this. Then we invite him to the third phrase, which is our struggle for victory. When we're saying, lead us not into temptation. Now, if we're praying this prayer, we're asking him to show up in every, of the, every one of these areas of our life. Sneak peek into next week. This lead us not into temptation is not asking God to come fix us out of a mess we created. It's asking him to ha- allow us to not get in the mess. <laughs> lead, don't let me get in the ditch. Give me wisdom not to fall to temptation. I know you can clean me up if I screw it up, but I'm praying that you give me the wisdom and the discipline and the accountability to keep me out of it. Uh, That's next week. Asking him to be awesome like that. Then we're asking him to be awesome when we say, uh, 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 deliver us from evil. And that's our struggle for protection, meaning we want him to give us victory over the evil one and his schemes in our lives. Do you see what we're doing? The first petitions are, you're all that. The last petitions are, I want you to be all that in my life. Number two, not only is is that broken up like that, but all of the petitions after hallowed be thy name serve the hallowed be thy name. All the other petitions are accomplishing the first of honoring the Lord's name and his reputation. So understanding the Lord's Prayer, I want you to get that the very first line is the whole point. Hallowed be thy name, honored is your reputation. Every other phrase goes back to that one. Thy kingdom come, because if your your kingdom comes, everybody will know how great you are. Your will be done in me, in earth as it is in heaven, because then in my life, people will see that you are all that. Give me my daily bread, not just to fill my tum-tum, But give me my daily bread so I can tell everybody you are a provider. Lead me not into temptation, not just because I don't want to fall in sin, but so people will know you're good to your name. Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies and makes me holy. You're leading me not into temptation, not just to make me holy, but to make your name holy. 
Every petition is pointing back to how awesome he is. Your life and my life and whatever state it's in should point to the holy, glorious reputation and name of God. See, it's all going back to him. In Exodus 32, uh, I think it was Exodus 32. Uh, the, the Israel, God, and, God was upset with the Israelites because, of, you know, they were always messing up in Exodus. Anyway, he's upset, and he's wanting to wipe them out. Thank God, you know, we've got grace, and he's never wanting to thump us in the head. But he's wanting to start over. And he looks at Moses, and he says, Mo, step out the way. I'm going to wipe every one of them out, and I'm going to start again with you, and I'm going to build the nation from Moses. Thank God that God and Moses never got angry on the same day. There were days God was ready to wipe them out, and Moses said, now hold on. And then there were days Moses was like, these people you gave me? And God said, hold on. So they never were angry on the same day. And this was a day God was like, Moses, I'm starting with you. With, if I'm selfish, doesn't sound bad as Mo. The nation of Moses kind of sounds good to me, right? I mean, I would, that would have been tempting. But Moses said, hold on. God, before you go wiping anybody out, you just led them out of Egyptian bondage only to kill them in the desert a few weeks or a few months later? Watch what Moses says. What will the Egyptians say about you if you do that? This isn't about the Israelites and how good they are. This is about your reputation in the world. And if that's the way you treat the people you call yours, that's not looking good on you. That's not like you, God. In other words, you're not hallowing your own reputation if you treat them that way. And God changed his mind and relented. The point of the Lord's prayer is this. How he responds to his children brings glory or dishonor to his own name. So if I'm his child and he's not providing daily bread and I'm going with lack, that's not pointing back to him being Jehovah Jireh. If I'm not living in grace and I'm full of condemnation and guilt, or if I'm bitter against somebody who did me wrong and I'm full of resentment, that's not pointing back to the awesome grace of a Savior. Right? If I'm constantly falling into temptation, that's not pointing back to the glorious nature of His holiness. So this prayer is saying, God, do this in me because when I do this and you, you're doing this in my life, it's going to serve point one. Hallowed be thy name. The point of our lives is to glorify Him. Sure, the blessings come. Sure, my tummy's full. Sure, I'm living in holiness. Sure, I have forgiveness. Sure, I can extend grace. But it's all because of His greatness, not my own. Y'all okay out there? Every good and perfect gift comes from Him above, not from me. So this Lord's Prayer keeps it in alignment. It's not me doing all this. It's God in me. So if I have provision, who? Why? Because he's great. If I'm forgiven of my sins, why? Because he's a great savior. If I've forgiven you because of how you offended me, why? Because God has extended that forgiveness to me. Following? So everything in this Lord's Prayer is talking back about how awesome he is. Okay, well, that was the introduction. So, give us this day our daily bread. Three things for you to fill out. First, give us means that... He is our source. God is the source of our life. This is the point in the prayer where we go from thy to my. And it's okay. I know I pick fun at, all, at the beginning of a lot of these when I'm talking about how people pray selfishly. Right? I want this, I want that, give me that. Free parking space or, or not a ticket or, or prosperity or the lottery, whatever. They're praying these selfish things. And this is the point in the prayer where it's okay to go from thy to my. We started off, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's all about you. And once we do that, he's okay with asking for my, give me my daily bread. He doesn't resent that. He just wants to know he's awesome to you before you ask all that. Making sense? What did Matthew 6.33 say? Seek you first the kingdom of God. Put me in first place. And I don't mind blessing you with all the other stuff. I got it. I'll throw it on you. Hallelujah. You know what he says? Your lack is no problem for my abundance. I got enough to hook you up. I just need to know you're not here for the hookup, and you're here so that I can lift you up as a savior and a deliverer. It's thy, my, as long as thy comes first. All right? I'm reminded of uh, 
I did this in the early service, and that, the first service usually shapes what I do in the second service. I don't know if y'all know that or even care. I don't even know what I'm telling you. Anyway, here we go. So the thought of Elijah came to me, and this was off script originally, but the thought of Elijah on Mount Carmel. A lot of you will know the story. Elijah is a prophet of God. He comes to Ahab, a wicked king, and says, it ain't going to rain until I tell it to rain. Pretty brazen, pretty awesome, you know, to know and, to, and to actually follow through with that, that's amazing. So it ain't going to rain for three, three years. So for three years, he's gone. Then finally, Elijah comes back, and the whole world is in turmoil, or, or the whole land is in turmoil because of famine. Come on, three years without rain is a big deal. You know, we stop flushing toilets after, what, three months of no rain, and everything starts going crazy because we're trying to conserve water. Three years, no rain. Elijah comes to Ahab and says, all right, here's the problem. Y'all were serving Baal and Ashtoreth and all these other gods, and you're forsaking the one true God. So I call everybody to a showdown on Mount Carmel, bring all your prophets of Baal up there, and I'm going to be up there for the real God, and whoever's really God's going to show up. And, and they have said, bet, we'll be there. And they call come 450 prophets. And Elijah says, I tell you what, I'll let you go first. How many knows when you know you've got the only God and the powerful God, you don't mind the enemy going first? <laughs> See, I said, I tell you what, y'all go first dibs. Y'all go ahead. So they built the altar, ready for the sacrifice. The deal was the God who answers by fire is going to be God. And they agreed. The prophets of Baal said, Deal. Baal's going to answer by fire. So they start early in the morning calling up to Baal to answer God, uh, for, uh, for them, him to answer by fire. Nothing. Why is there nothing? Because Baal is a phony. <laughs> there is no God other than our God. So they're calling for Baal. It gets bad. They start dancing and whirling and shouting trying to get his attention. Elijah has a little bit of Georgia boy in him. So he gets sarcastic. And he says, hey, uh, maybe your God's hard of hearing. Maybe you need to shout louder. A couple of them say, well, maybe he's on vacay. Maybe he's on holiday. Maybe he's vacationing. One version says, maybe he's in the john. Maybe he's in the bathroom taking care of business, and you need to wait until he comes out. Sends them in a frenzy. They start cutting themselves to show how intensely they won't be able to answer. Bleeding all over the place, and still no answer. They've wrecked the altar. It's a mess. And Elijah, uh, afternoon time, he said, all right, don't hurt yourself anymore. It's my turn. He restores the altar. I'm going somewhere with this. He restores the altar, and after it's restored and ready, he goes, do you remember what he orders to be done? To pour water on top of the altar. I used to think, and it could be argued that it's part of a point, but I used to think it was to prove that the fire of God will even consume wet wood. Be honest, did you think that when you first heard this? Well, yeah, he's just making it harder. Only three people, okay. Uh, uh, he's just making it harder for God so they'll know God is, is all-consuming fire and he can even burn up a wet wood altar. And yet that, I don't think, is the most powerful point. What hadn't happened in three years? Rain. The most precious commodity in the land was Water. And when he said, get three barrels of water, or four barrels of water, and throw it on the altar, and he told him to do it three times, do you know what he was doing? He was saying, I'm going to take the most precious thing in our land, and I'm going to pour it as a sacrifice on the altar to the one and true God. Why, you ask? Because God's problem is not getting us the supply of water. God can make it rain anytime he wants to. The problem God had was a land not recognizing him as the only God. That's his issue. Oh, I feel glory. Just to, I bless myself. The nation of America is not, we don't need more provision or more economy or more dollars or more trade. We need to recognize God is the only true God. When we recognize that, he can send the blessing. God can send rain. He just needs to know you put him first. And right after Elijah prayed, God answered by fire. And just a little while longer, he hears the abundance of rain. And God sends the rain. Why? Because God was put back in his rightful place. So he don't mind thy to my when you put thy in his proper place. Hallelujah. That just blessed me. He can send the rain anytime he wants. He just needs to know, am I first in your life? Give us. He is our source. 
give us. It's a community prayer. It's not give me. This is a time in prayer where I'm not just praying for me, I'm praying for you. This is a time when we get a text or the staff sends out a text that so-and-so is going through surgery right now. Or somebody just found out their grandmother has COVID. Or this person just lost their job. I'm praying for you. And you should be praying for others. This is give us. We're in this together. This is small groups around a table. Give us. We're praying for one another's needs. God is our source. And this is where it comes down to realizing that if it wasn't for God, we would have nothing. I'm not the rainmaker. You're not the rainmaker. You and that company or you and that business wouldn't be nothing if it wasn't for somebody enabling you to have breath in your lungs and to have the creativity to even do what you do. I'm trying to help somebody here not hit rock bottom. Because about the moment we start thinking we did this, our ingenuity, our hard work, I picked myself up by my own bootstraps, that's about the point God's going to have to step in and say, uh, you, I will share everything with you, but I will not share my glory with you. You remember uh, the dude in Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament who took credit for Babylon? Look at the great Babylon I built. And you could hear God in heaven say, easy. You know, it, it don't make me come down there easy. And he, he comes out again. This is the great, look what I've done. I've built these gardens. I've designed that building. I have all these servants. I have all these people. This is my kingdom. God said, all right. Strikes him with insanity to the point he's crawling on all fours in a field, eating grass, feathers growing on him. His hair looks like feathers, looking like an insane maniac. Until it dawned on him again. And he glorified God for who he was. And the day that he chose to give God credit for who he was, his sanity returned to him. All God is after is for us to recognize he is our source. He is the one. Nobody else. He is our source. And this comes to uh, Genesis 22. Abraham is in covenant with God. Oh, am I doing okay? Y'all still with me? I don't want to keep rambling if I've lost you. All right, good. So, I, I'm coming, I'm coming. So, Genesis 22, Abraham's in covenant with God, and God has promised Abraham a covenant will be uh, 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 fulfilled through your son Isaac. Then, God seems schizophrenic and crazy because he gets up one day. No offense to anybody struggling with that. I, I say, anyway, he gets up one day and he says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your only son. No argument. Abraham gets up, takes his son up to Mount Moriah. Takes him three days to get there. He's climbing up a mountain. And Isaac is a teenage boy, sharp enough to figure out something is awry. He looks around, got the wood, got the charcoal lighter, you know, got the bick, got all we need. We're missing something here, Dad. Where's the sacrifice? What are we killing? Most of our, if you look at a lot of the versions, they say, don't worry, son. God will provide for himself. Not God will provide us. God will provide for himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Meaning, son, this ain't my problem. It ain't your problem. This is God's problem. We're in covenant with him. He's got promises he has to fulfill. So if you, he didn't say this to him, but if you end up dead, God's going to have to raise you back up because he promised you're the guy. This isn't my problem. He's not providing me a lamb. He's providing for himself a lamb. And when I'm in alignment with him, it's God's, it's God's responsibility to take care of my needs. So they get up on the mountain. Abraham's about to kill Isaac. The angel stops him. And what do you know? A ram is over there in the bushes. And they kill it, sacrifice it, and they call the name of the mountain Jehovah Jireh because the Lord will provide. Here's the whole point. God will provide for himself, meaning God takes responsibility for the provision of our lives when we give him preeminence. If you're doing it on your own, you're on your own. Your business, your sales record, you did all that? All right, you can do all that. But God forbid a famine hits. But when you say, hey, this business belongs to the Lord, 
All the sales I'm bringing in is because the Lord has given me breath. I give you honor. I give you credit, Lord. I submit my life and surrender my life to your hands. That means it's his responsibility to take care of everything. Is your business the Lord's business or your business? If it's your business, you got situations and problems. But if it's his business and sales plummet, guess what? God, you got a problem. Because it's his. Am I making that? I'm not dumbing that down too much, right? I mean, that God will provide for himself. He is the source. And here's the good thing about God being our source. It never changes. Everybody's worried about the economy. What's the economy going to do in 2021? I don't know if this company's going to make it or not. don't know what my portfolio is going to do, and I need to retire in three years. Everybody's worried about this. My source never changes. And, he is all, and, and my lack is not a problem when it's linked to his abundance. Oh, hallelujah. He is faithful as a source to provide. And when we say give us, it's not or irritating him. Jesus said, I want you to say give us this day our daily bread. Luke 12, 32, it is our, the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He loves it. Psalm 103, he fills my life with good things. He's a giver. Number two, give us this day. And this means I'm going to live in the now. I want to live in the now. And that's simple, yet it's profound, because a lot of us worry about things way off, or we're living way back in the past. And this simple statement says, I'm going to walk with God daily, and I'm going to trust God daily. I'm not, I'm not going to pray today for provision for next month. I'm not going to pray today for protection this weekend. I'm not going to pray today for forgiveness for the rest of the year's sins. It took that one to get both services. Everybody was dead stone silent until I got to Oh, that kind of makes sense. Why? Why will I not pray for next week's provision? Because I'm coming back tomorrow to pray again. This isn't a one and done deal. I'll be right back tomorrow saying, give me this day, my daily bread. Why am I not praying for forgiveness for five months from now? Because I'm going to be coming back again. And he's going to be a daily provider for me. He doesn't want me to pray today, store up enough that I don't have to pray again for 10 days. He wants me to live daily with him. Is that making sense? And if I live in tomorrow, I, then I'll begin to worry. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, what you'll eat or what you'll wear. God will take care of your tomorrow. Live to, Tomorrow's got enough trouble of its own. Why are you barring yes, tomorrow's troubles in today's present? It's hard to be happy when you're worried about tomorrow. Some of you are worried about relationships that don't even exist yet. <laughs> you worried about getting married. You ain't got a boyfriend yet. What do you mean? <laughs> worried about kids you hadn't even conceived yet. Why are y'all borrowing from trouble that ain't even yours? And when we begin to worry, we begin to say this to God. We don't mean to, but it's doubting, saying, I'm just not sure you're going to be what I need tomorrow. So I'd rather you show up big enough today that I don't have to worry with you tomorrow. That's what worry does. It makes it, I'm just unsure of your faithfulness for Wednesday. So can you bless me so much today, I can breathe a little bit. <laughs> He's like, no. Why don't you come back tomorrow and you'll find out I'm just as good tomorrow as I am today. And come back Tuesday, you'll find out I'm, 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 a, I'm a Tuesday God too. I'm a good God on Tuesdays. You'll find out Wednesday's not hump day for me, it's just all the same. It's a good day for me. Thank God it's Friday, whatever. It's a good Friday. It's a good Monday. It's all good because I am faithful through all of it. Amen. Now, as I say that, I'm a planner and a thinker. And there's a lot of people out there be like, well, what about retirement investments and college funds and all that? This is not saying you shouldn't plan for tomorrow. But it's just saying that your planning and investing for tomorrow shouldn't keep you from having to trust God today. Proverbs 30 and verse 8 and 9. Beautiful, beautiful wisdom here. Keep falsehood and lies far from me and listen to the wisdom. I don't want poverty and I don't want riches. <laughs> I'd like to, don't raise your hand, but how many in the room prayed for that? I think we all prayed. I, hey, I don't want no poverty now. But I think many of us have been on the other side. If you'd like to bless me, I wouldn't mind a little extra something, something. You know, I wouldn't mind. But this guy said, don't give me too much, don't give me too little. Why? If I have too much, I might forget you. 
I'm, he's not saying you can't be wealthy. He's just saying if you are, you better stay close to the cross and remember why you are. But he's saying if I have too much, I might forget that I need you. And I don't want that. And if I have too little, I may steal just to survive and disown or profane your name. And I don't want that. So give me just, 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 just give me just what I need. If you give me just what I need, I'm good. I'm blessed. All right? So give me today, and then tomorrow I'll come back and you give me tomorrow. And that's the beauty of this thing. I will walk with God. Day. Our walk with God is daily. My trust with God is daily. My prayer life is daily. So here it is. Everybody say, I'm listening. I don't get enough of Jesus on Sunday to last me to next Sunday. I'm glad you're in the room. But this is one out of seven. You've got to get in a habit of tomorrow getting up and saying, hey, I know the church doors ain't going, I can't do that, but I'm still here, Lord, and I'm still standing in the need of prayer. I'm still needing you to show up in my life. I can't hoard up enough. Because here's what happens. Do you know what would happen if we hoard up enough? If we have this huge nest egg, then we start trusting in the nest egg more than we trust in him. And you're trusting in your barns instead of his bakery. <laughs> Oh, why do you want old stale bread from your barn when he breaks up new bread, fresh bread every day ready to pour out into your life? Well, half of you liked some of that. <laughs> number three. Yeah, before I go to number three, get that off the screen. I would just like to mention, <laughs> my timer's broke, so I don't have, you're just going to have to go with me here. I don't, I don't know what time it is. Oh, oh, I just need three of you. Three of you, we can have church. Two or three. The rest of you can walk out. Two or three, Jesus stays with us. You know what I'm saying? I'm kidding. It won't be crazy long. What was I saying? Oh, Danette and I have lived through many phases of blessings, many phases of life. We loved each other so much in college and we, we rushed getting married. I don't want to get into that disservice. But uh, we got married after our sophomore year of college. Didn't have anything. Didn't he have a good job? We're both full-time students. Had these little part-time things going. Lived in a tiny, single-wide trailer in the middle of a hot field in South Carolina that the, both window units couldn't get it below 80 degrees in the house. But we loved each other. <laughs> she drove a beat-up Mazda GLC. If you don't know what that is, there's a reason you don't know what that is. <laughs> they didn't continue making them. <laughs> Shut that junk down. <laughs> you know what a 626 is, right? Because it made it a long time. GLCs didn't make it. I had a beat-up Cavalier. I, when I was a youth pastor, I drove a beat-up 8- to 10-year-old Honda Civic. I was happy to have a Honda at the time until the youth group started saying, let's get an old doo-doo brown car over there making fun of the color of my car. And then I began to realize I'm not as, not as happy as I should. Anyway, I'm too happy about it. Anyway, and God took care of us. We never went without a meal, never went without clothing, never went without shelter. And I can tell you I was blessed at every phase. I drive a pickup now that's a lot nicer than the doo-doo brown <laughs> Civic. But I am no more blessed today than I was then. God's blessings can't be measured simply by material junk. So don't let anybody size you up according to prosperity versus not prosperity. All of us go through lean times. But don't let yourself or your heart or anybody around you put a voice in your head saying, God isn't good to you in the lean times as good as he was in the... No, sir. I can walk down the road because I don't have anything to drive. And I'm just as blessed because God is moving in my life as I am when I'm driving something nice. He is a faithful God. What did, what did the psalmist say? I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Begging bread. He's going to take care of you. Can we just be a body of believers that some are up here in affluence, some are struggling, some are blessed, some are unemployed, and we all just be the body of Christ and say, God is still a good God no matter what's going on in my life. Well, 
Oh, now they put a timer on me. I got two minutes for some reason. All right, number three. <laughs> Too late. Take that junk down. That ain't happening. It's going to be about seven or eight. Number three, give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread points to the fact that God's faithfulness is always uh, consistent and it's always on time. When he says, give us this day our daily bread, as I mentioned, get whole wheat, honey wheat out of your head. Daily bread is a symbol word, and it means everything you need for the day. So in your prayer life, if you're modeling your prayer life after the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, you're praying for anything you need that day. For somebody, you're going to need strength in your body because you're, you're just wore out. Somebody else... You're going to need mental sharpness and mental acuity for your presentation on the job. Somebody else, you're going to have a job interview. You're going to need God's favor on you. That's daily bread. There may be people who are more qualified than you are, but you're walking in with the hand of the Lord on your life. That can make the difference. That's daily bread. Strength for today. Patience with those children. God help. Right? Wisdom in a decision, creativity on a project, that's daily bread. Tell me, I, I, uh, Howard Kelly, uh, he's a guy that worships in the first service. He's literally talked about, uh, he's an HVAC guy. Can't figure out why a unit's not working. Puts the tools down, walks to his truck five minutes, talks to the Lord a little bit, comes back, and the Lord puts his finger on something and fixes it. Tell me God won't give you what you need when you need it every single day. <laughs> daily bread. And as the band comes up, yesterday's bread's not good enough for today. You can't rob from yesterday for today. Because God's, well, let's just go. Uh, Exodus, I think it's 16. The children of Israel, we're talking millions of Israelites now in the wilderness, and they have nothing to eat, nothing to drink, and they're looking back on Egypt, and they're remembering the chicken and the, and the pork chops and the potatoes they had back there. And they said, uh, Moses, we got a problem. We're hungry. And there's no food. They started grumbling. And God said, tell them to calm down. I've not forsaken them. I'm going to supply fresh bread every day. And they woke up one morning, and there's flaky, flaky pieces of bread. Tastes like honey all over the ground. He said, there's your bread. Just go pick it up. And as he told them, go pick it up, he said, now, don't pick up more than you need today. It'll be there. I'll be faithful tomorrow. It'll be there tomorrow, except for the Sabbath. Pick up two days then. I don't have time for that one. Except, But it'll be there tomorrow. Don't pick up more than you need today. And yet still, there was an Israelite named Chad who, <laughs> who just didn't trust that so well. He said, I'm going to get ahead of the game. And Chad picked up more than today's share of manna. And he hid it in the pantry. Only to find out the next morning when Chad opened up his pantry, the manna was full of maggots. And God says, I'm not going to let you steal from yesterday's blessings and live it out today. Because if, I, if you get too much blessing yesterday, you may forget that you need me today. And if you want to remember one statement before you go home, and this is the statement I would want you to remember, we need God as desperately on our best day as we do on our worst day. Hear me. It doesn't matter how blessed and how prosperous you are and what the 401k says. You need him just as much when you have abundance as you did when you had nothing. I need to trust him in the morning no matter how blessed I am. And God says, I'm not going to let you store up manna to the point you forget me tomorrow. I'll be there tomorrow. Just trust me. And for any addict in the room, you may be eight years clean. I want you to know you need him just as much today to stay clean as you did on day one. Everybody in here that you've got a job and it's going well, you need him just as much today as the day you were unemployed. And if we live our lives saying, I need you every hour, most precious Lord. I need you whether it's good or bad. I need you in the rain and in the sunshine. I need you. That's when he says, I'll be right there for you. Lamentations 3, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His compassions fail not. They are new every single morning. 
God blessing you today, and he'll be there tomorrow. He'll be there tomorrow. And you live out tomorrow under the blessing of the Lord, and you get up Tuesday, and you'll find out he's going to be there Tuesday. Great is thy faithfulness. And when everybody wonder how you made it through the lean season, how you made it unemployed, how you made it through that sickness, you'll say, hallowed be his name. Great is his faithfulness to me. It's not me. It's not my strength. It's not my creativity. Hallowed be his name. See how good he is to me? That's how good God is. Don't you want to know him? Well, the concentration camps ended at the end of World War II. All the camp survivors were liberated, and there was an organization working with children. And after weeks and weeks of eating every day and eating well, and their little emaciated bodies were strengthened, and they had clothes, and they were in good environments, they still had a problem getting them to sleep. They couldn't figure out the kids are well fed, the kids are loved on, the kids have clothing, the kids for day after day after day and weeks now, they, they've been living the blessed life compared to what they were and they still wouldn't go to sleep. And somebody, I think it was a psychologist, came up and said, can we try something? Can we just try and take a piece of bread and put it in their hands when they go to bed at night? So as they're laying down and they're contemplating tomorrow, they can have something in their hand. And the study found out that they went to sleep and got rest. Because evidently in their little mind, their minds was tormented. That all they were living in the eating and all the clothes was just a dream. And they're going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be forsaken and gone. And they would worry so much that tomorrow wouldn't be so good. But as long as they had something in their hand, it was a reminder that when I get up in the morning, I'm going to have something to put my mouth into. And if nothing else, I want this message and this book right here to be in your heart and in your hand to know when you lay your head down tonight, the God who was with you and spoke to you in, he spoke to you in the service right here. That same God is going to put breath in your lungs tomorrow. That same God is going to strengthen you on the job. That same God will be faithful all the days of your life. Amen. Would you stand on your feet? Lord, in Jesus' name. We ask you to speak to us. We ask you to challenge us to surrender everything to you. And to just get in the habit of daily, before we say, give us our daily bread, saying, our Father, our Father, your name is great. Your reputation is amazing. I pray your kingdom is done and your will comes to my life. And because you're that great, would you provide for me? pray in Jesus' name, your blessings begin to pour out. Your spirit just speaks peace to our hearts, and we know that we're not alone in Jesus' name. Guys, we're going to sing. The altars are wide open. Uh, if you want to pray about any need you may have or a situation, you can come down and pray. We're still letting people pray alone. If, if you want to pray with somebody, grab us over here. We'll, somebody will pray with you. We'll do that. You need grace? He's a grace-giving Savior need strength. He's a healer. You need provision. He's a provider. Let's just give it to him. Come on, let's worship before we leave together. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope that the message was a blessing to you and an encouragement to you. If it was, we'd just like to take a few more seconds of your time and ask you to do a few things. First of all, if you don't mind, there's a digital connection card that you could submit and, and, and send our way, and it'll let us stay connected to you more personally. First, it'll let, you, let us know who you are. Second, how frequent, frequently you tune in. And also, there's a place for prayer requests, and we would love to partner with you and pray about what's going on in your life. The second thing that would be great is if you could just take a moment, click a link, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can stay connected with what's going on at The Point every week. And also, man, if this was a blessing to you today, it might be an encouragement and a blessing to somebody in your friend group or in your network of influence. So why don't you just share this video and pray that God uses it 
to encourage them as well. Finally, if uh, you'd like to consider blessing this ministry financially, there's a giving link at the bottom. You can click down there and that'll help us continue to throw out videos like this that could be a life changer for somebody out there. So guys, thank you again for joining us. We're so blessed that you did. We're so honored to have you as a part of our online family. And we want you to know one more thing. We love you so much and we can't wait to see you next time.